Ryder and his pups had just returned from the Halloween party after rescuing the mayor and the others from the runaway ship. The moon was at its highest point in the night sky, shining its brilliant light. As Ryder walked through the entrance of the lookout, he yawned as he removed his golden night helmet. Well, that was certainly an interesting Halloween, he said. I'll say, added Rocky. And what was with that ghost ship flying past the moon? Rubble shivered at the mention of the ghost ship. Don't talk about that. That was too scary, he said while taking off his costume. Dude, I don't even know if I'll be able to sleep tonight, said Zuma, getting equally scared. I had completely forgotten about that until you brought it up, Rocky, said Skye, looking a bit terrified. D don't worry, Skye. S Super Chase is here to protect d you, Chase told her, sounding very unsure of himself. Marshall covered his eyes while leaning toward the ground, shivering. C could Super Chase protect me too? He said shakily. Ryder smiled sheepishly, watching his pups get worked up over something that he was sure wasn't a big deal. Guys, calm down. There's a logical explanation to what we saw. There's no need to lose any sleep over it, he tried to reassure. And what's that? asked an unconvinced rubble. Ryder rubbed his chin, thinking quickly of a calming answer. Well, it could have just been a cloud. A cloud shaped exactly like a ghost ship, rubble argued. I'm with Ryder, chimed in Rocky. I'm sure it was just a cloud. With all that went on tonight... It makes sense that our imaginations would run a little wild. But dude, we all saw it. It's pretty unlikely that all of us would imagine the same thing, Zuma countered. Not entirely. Sometimes our minds can perceive certain figures and images the same way another's mind would, explained Ryder. Exactly. Thank you, Ryder. Rocky co-signed smugly. Yeah, I'm still not convinced, said Rubble. Yeah! Marshall screamed, diving behind Chase and clung to his leg, shivering. Marshall, it's just lightning, said Ryder. But the skies were clear not too long ago. That's too freaky, replied Sky. The five pups began to talk amongst each other with frightened faces. Rocky and Ryder turned to face each other before huffing. Ryder then faced the group again. I'm sure after a good night's rest, we'll all be able to process things more logically, he said. R Ryder, can I sleep in the lookout tonight? Please, please, Marshall asked, giving him the puppy dog pout. The other four pups joined him as they faced Ryder and whimpered. Rocky rolled his eyes. Ryder stroked his chin. He knew it wouldn't help the situation if he told them that they had to sleep outside. All right, you can all sleep in here tonight, he replied. The five breathed a sigh of relief. Thanks, Ryder, said Marshall as he licked Ryder's hand. Well, I guess I'll be the only one sleeping in my pup house tonight, Rocky said smugly while walking off. If I see the ghost, I'll be sure to yelp for help. He joked while the lookout doors closed behind him. Well, pups, the rest of you should prepare for bed as well, Ryder said. The five pups slowly made their way to the entertainment room of the lookout. Ryder walked to the entrance doors of the lookout and stepped out. He looked to the sky and noticed that many clouds were starting to gather and that the moon had a rather eerie red tint to it. That's weird. I don't recall the weather forecast mentioning a storm for tonight, he thought to himself before returning into the lookout. Rocky was inside of his closed pup house, preparing to lie down. His costume was messily placed on the floor. He turned on a little nightlight before sitting on the floor and getting lost in his thoughts. As much as he didn't want to admit it, the other pups' counter-argument on what they all saw had really gotten to him. He wanted to be brave 
and believed that it was all their imagination, but something kept tugging at the back of his mind, telling him otherwise. He felt lonely and secluded, locked inside of his pup house. He wanted to join the others, but after making fun of them while trying to cover his own fear, he simply didn't have the nerve to face them. Writer's right, he said to himself. Maybe all we need is a good night's rest. He turned off the main light, leaving only the night light on. Within minutes, he drifted to sleep. Mayor Goodway was finishing off the last of some Halloween candy while sitting in a recliner, watching TV with a frightened expression. Oh, this late night Halloween movie marathon is going to keep me up all night, she stated wildly before she continued to stuff her mouth. As she crunched on the next pieces of candy, the TV and power within her house shut off. Mayor Goodway jumped with eyes darting back and forth across the room. Ch Chicoletta? Are you messing with the fuse box again? The mayor questioned. Those who gaze at the moon as I pass shall soon find that night to be their last, uttered a mysterious voice. Who? Who said that? The mayor asked as she became more uneasy. The sound of breaking glass coming from the kitchen was the only response she received. She was now in a complete panic. Wearing only her nightgown, she made a dash for the front door. Once her hand touched the doorknob, she began to call out to her beloved purse chicken. Chicoletta? Chicoletta? She called. Mommy's leaving. We need to get out of here. To the mayor's displeasure, there was no response from Chicoletta. She pulled out her cell phone and turned on the flashlight feature. Chicoletta? She called once more, her eyes searching the area. She moved the path of the light to the direction of the kitchen. She saw what looked to be loose feathers and gasped. She slowly crept closer to the kitchen, heart beating rapidly. Ch Chicoletta? Are you in there, sweetums? The light shining from the cell phone was beginning to shake within her grasp. She stepped one foot into the kitchen and began to move the path of the light to the left. When she caught sight of something, she instantly froze and dropped her phone. What she caught sight of was Chicoletta's head, covered in blood, with glass shards lodged in her neck, eyes, and face. The rest of her body was under the debris of a dish cabinet that had somehow detached from the wall. The mayor screamed a scream that seemed to echo all throughout Adventure Bay. Paw Patrol to the lookout, Ryder said as the six pups' tags began to flash. After a few minutes had passed, all six drowsy members were in their designated spots awaiting orders. Paw Patrol ready for action, Rudder, sir, Chase announced with a light yawn while wearing his spy gear. Uh, guys, what's with the moon? Zuma said as he stared out of the tower windows at the red glowing sphere. The, the, that's, uh, uh, blood moon, shouted Rubble in a panic. A blood moon? Oh no! I'm really scared now! Super Chase didn't sign up for this! What's a blood moon? All the pups turned to face Marshall. What? I think the moon looks good in red, he replied happily. Rubble face palmed himself. Marshall, blood moons mean that something bad is about to happen. Oh replied the dolly as his ears drooped. Pups, we need to focus on the mission, Ryder announced, bringing everyone's attention back. Ryder tapped his pup pad and brought up the big screen display. 
I received an emergency call from Mayor Goodway not too long ago. She seemed really distressed. She wouldn't stop crying and kept repeating Chicoletta over and over, he said while a cartoon image of a crying Mayor Goodway appeared on the big screen. I couldn't make out anything else she was saying, but if I had to guess, I would say that Chicoletta must be in some kind of trouble. He pressed another button on his pup pad, and all six pup tags appeared on the screen. Since we don't have many details, we'll go ahead and have all paws on deck, just in case. Great! Now some of us won't have to be left here alone, Rubble replied slightly relieved, gaining a nod from a few of the others. All right! Paw Patrol is on a roll! Ryder shouted, pumping his fist in the air. However, right after finishing his catchphrase, all power within the lookout was unexpectedly shut off. Those who gaze at the moon as I pass shall soon find that night to be their last. The mysterious voice rang around the room of the lookout. Ah! I don't want to die! Rubble screamed as he ran off with tears in his eyes. Rubble, wait! Ryder called out to him. Rubble had enough. He sprinted to the slide and slid out of the lookout. Unbeknownst to him, the rotation mechanism had rotated and moved Sky's pup house to the end of the slide. Sky's pup house transformed into her copter, and the propeller blades began to spin at an incredible speed. The others saw this from the tower window and tried desperately to call out to the bulldog. Nearing the end of the slide, Rubble's ears picked up the sound of the propeller. Ah! That's not my rig! He yelled as he frantically tried to move his paws as fast as he could and climb back up the slide. But to his disadvantage, his paws could not grip the slide. With tears in his eyes, he called for help. Rider! The group watched in horror as fur, skin, flesh, and bones were torn apart from the bulldog's body, piece by piece from the bottom up. When nothing was left, the propeller blades slowed down and came to a complete stop. They were coated with blood and fleshy remains. Crimson-covered entrails decorated the copter, slide, grass, and concrete. Rubble's pup tag and collar were laid on the ground, shimmering in red with a chunk of the bulldog's neck fur attached to it. Sky bursted into a painful heart-wrenching cry. Marshall sat with his paws on his head, eyes wide, frozen in shock with tears dripping down his cheeks. Rocky held his mouth to stop himself from spewing vomit while his tears flowed freely. Zuma and Chase were looking away, bawling their eyes out. Ryder himself just stood there motionless as he dropped his pup pad to the floor. I don't understand. How could that have happened? He asked, staring into space. This can't be real. He fell to his knees and covered his face with his hands, letting out sob after sob. Mayor Goodway was still weeping uncontrollably in the dark at the spot where a deceased Chicoletta lay. Ryder, please hurry! She wailed through tears. The lights began to flicker on and off again repeatedly. Those who gaze at the moon as I pass shall soon find that night to be their last, spoke the familiar voice. No! She screamed as she ran towards the front door. She tried to turn the knob, but found that it would not budge. She heard heavy footsteps coming from the kitchen, but when she turned her head to face the direction, no one was there. She kept her eyes peeled in the same direction as the footsteps sounded as if they were coming closer and closer. Mayor Goodway backed up against the front door, still waiting to see the source of the footsteps, when suddenly... They stopped. The mayor was panting and breathing heavily. She closed her eyes as she tried to relax her breathing and calm herself. 
she opened her eyes and screamed. There before her stood a man dressed in pirate attire. He had a black beard that was drenched in blood, a sharp bloody hook that was shaped much like a curved knife, an eye patch over one eye, and the other eye was just a red eyeball which had neither an iris nor pupil. Before the mayor could finish her scream, the mysterious man cut it short as he jabbed his hook deep into her neck and quickly but smoothly ripped it open. Crimson waves began to spew from the mayor's neck, staining her purely white nightgown and trickle from her mouth while her head tilted back as if it was a can opened by a can opener. Before her now lifeless body was able to hit the floor, the mysterious murderer vanished. Ryder continued to sob in the dark on the lookout floor, blaming himself for what happened to Rubble. I'm so sorry, Rubble. I'm so, so sorry. The rotation mechanisms never malfunctioned like that before. The entrance to the slide is supposed to scan each of you and identify your personal vehicle. He slammed his fist on the floor. I should have kept constant maintenance on it. This is all my fault. He cried heavily. Chase tried his best to comfort him while he tried to hold himself together. Rocky, with tear-stained eyes, was searching something on Ryder's pup pad, tapping his paw here and there across the screen. The words that had been spoken by the unknown voice still rung around in his head. Those who gaze at the moons I pass shall soon find that night to be their last. He thought to himself, trying to decipher the terrible riddle. His eyes widened as realization settled on him. He began to search, flying ghost ship passing by moon. A picture of the exact same ghost ship passing a moon appeared on the screen in an electronic article. Guys, he called out to the others in a shaky voice. I know this is a bad time, but you need to hear this. I pulled up an article on the ghost ship we saw. It says that not too many have seen the paranormal scene, but if you do happen to see it, it's considered to be a bad omen. Those who have seen the ship float past the moon have either been involved in freak accidents that led to their death, or have been murdered. The reporter who captured this photo was found the next day, hanging from a flagpole by his <clears throat> intestines. Rocky gagged at the thought of that scene, also remembering rubble for a split second before a tear trickled down his cheek. He wiped his eyes before continuing to read the article. According to the legend, the name of the ship is called the Reaper. The Reaper was a pirate ship that belonged to a pirate who went by the name Bloodbeard. Bloodbeard was a cold-blooded pirate. He murdered the innocent and took from them no matter the circumstance. One night, after pillaging the town which is now known as Adventure Bay, the king ordered him to be found and executed. Bloodbeard and his crew tried to sell away using the dark night and cloudy skies as cover, but the clouds moved from in front of the moon and the light shining from it illuminated the ocean, giving away the pirate's position. The king's soldiers fired a barrage of cannonballs from the pier and sunk Bloodbeard's ship leaving no trace of the pirates. Rocky looked back at the picture of the ship in the article. His eyes were concentrating hard, as if he had seen the vessel before. He gasped. The... The ship? If I can remember right, it's the same ship that Zuma was trapped under when we saved the Murpups, he stated. Sky walked towards the mixed breed with fear in her eyes. So does that mean everyone who sees the ship past the moon dies? Rocky sat the pup pad down before lowering his head in silence. That's what it sounds like, he answered. The ghost, 
It's real. It's real. Tears began to fill his eyes again as he continued. I should have sided with you guys. I shouldn't have teased you for believing. If I would have agreed, maybe Ryder would have taken it more seriously and Rubble wouldn't be. He trailed off, white little droplets splashed on the floor. I want Rubble back! Rocky screamed, throwing his hat across the room. I was just as scared as you guys. The difference is, you were all brave enough to admit it. He stated with tears pouring down. I'm the coward. The coward who teased his friends for being scared. His friends. It should have been me who went down the slide and... He was cut off by a paw placed over his mouth. He looked up to see a tearful sky. Rocky, stop. She pleaded through tears. You're hurting us. Rocky looked up to see everyone next to him with wide, tearful eyes before being ambushed by a hug. Rocky, please, don't ever say that again. Please, Zuma pled as he embraced him with worry. Chase stepped forward, placing a boot on his shoulder. None of us blame you or Ryder, Chase said, while Marshall nodded with agreement behind him. An important detail clicked within the Dalmatian's mind. Guys, we all saw it, he stated. That's right, agreed Sky. Us, Captain Turbot, Alex, Mr. Porter, Katie, Callie, Mayor Goodway, and Chicoletta. Ryder's eyes shot open. Oh no, Mayor Goodway he said, remembering the mayor's distress call. He quickly picked his pup pad off the floor and tried to call the mayor. No one answered. We have to go and check on the others. Once we're all together, we can try and find a safe place. I'll go and check on Mayor Goodway and Chicoletta. Chase and Marshall, you two go and check on Alex and Mr. Porter. Sky and Zuma, you check on Captain Turbot. Rocky and Rub... Ryder paused for a moment before finishing his sentence. He wasn't used to being one pup short, but this was no time to be consumed by grief. It's all right, Ryder. I can go check on Katie and Callie alone, Rocky answered, staring at the floor sadly. Are you sure? Ryder asked, regaining his composure. Yeah. It's time for me to be brave, Rocky answered. Okay, Paw Patrol is on a roll, Ryder announced with not even the tiniest bit of enthusiasm and happiness that he normally shows when saying the phrase. Spy Chase headed for the slide. Wait, shouted Ryder. Don't take the slide. I, I don't want to take any chances. He pulled out his pup pad and began tapping across the screen. But sir... How will we get down? Chase asked, curious. The slide and elevator are the only ways down, and the power is out. This will just take a second, Ryder replied, still tapping his screen. Okay, auxiliary power on! He shouted after tapping one last button. The power all around the lookout flashed back on, and the sound of some machines whirring and computers booting up can be heard. Ryder ran to the elevator with the five following him, and they descended to the ground floor. As the elevator door opened, Ryder wore a serious expression. Pups, please be careful, said Ryder. The five slowly nodded. There's no way I can get my ATV, so I guess I'll have to... Ryder paused before finishing. Take Rubble's rig. Ryder shook his head. Okay, pups. Let's head outside, he commanded. The five pups exited through the automatic doors as they opened and closed. Once outside, they waited for Ryder to join them. Ryder walked towards the exit doors. The doors wouldn't budge. Those who gaze at the moon as I pass shall soon find that night to be their last. 
Rider's heart stopped upon hearing the familiar voice, and once again, the power within the lookout had shut off. The five pups stared worriedly at the entrance of the lookout, wondering why Ryder had not yet emerged and why the power had once again shut off. Curious, Chase made his way over to the double doors. Uh, Ryder, sir? Are you coming? Ryder quickly tried to force the doors open with his hands. He struggled and grunted, using every ounce of his strength. But the doors still did not part. He reached into his pocket and pulled out his pup pad to try and reactivate the auxiliary power once again. But once he tapped his screen, he found that the device would not power on. No. He thought to himself as he continued tapping the black screen. He pushed himself up against the entrance doors. Pups! The power is out again! I... I think it's the ghost pirate. I heard the voice. He gulped. I can't reactivate the power. I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I need the five of you to continue this mission without me. The five pups gasped, all running to the entrance doors, leaning and banging on them. No, Ryder, we're not leaving without you, said Chase. We can't lose another member, cried Marshall. This is an order, Ryder yelled in a very harsh manner. He never once had to use a tone of this nature or raise his voice with them, and they were all very shocked. Chase wanted to argue back to tell him that he could not obey this order, but he knew that Ryder had made up his mind for them to go. It was not going to back down. With sorrow-filled eyes, he turned to face the others. We need to go, he said, gaining a surprised look from the others. What? We just can't leave Ryder, Sky argued. These are our orders. We have to obey. It's what Ryder wants. Another second we're here. It's another second the others could be in danger. The others stared at the ground. They knew Chase was right. Marshall, if it's all right with you, I'd like to pair up with Skye and check on the porters. I have something important I need to talk to her about. Do you mind pairing up with Zuma? The Dalmatian lowered his ears. Sure, that's fine, he replied, lowering his head sadly. Chase noticed Marshall's expression and wanted to question it, but instead decided to brush it off. He proceeded to walk to his vehicle with the others, following behind, heading to their designated areas as well. As the group walked around to their pub houses, they couldn't help but notice the slide decorated with blood, sliced bones, and entrails that came from their close friend. They tried their best to keep it together as memories of his horrible death came flooding back. With these terrible memories, their worry for Ryder only increased. Zuma, Chase, Rocky, and Marshall each approached their pup house and pressed the switch that caused them to transform into their vehicles. Skye hopped into the back of Chase's police cruiser. She didn't want to take her helicopter for obvious reasons. The four lined their vehicles up in a horizontal row. Once either of you find any of the others safe or... Otherwise, just contact the rest of us, said Chase. The other three simply nodded. With that said, the five turned to look at the lookout once more. Please be safe, Ryder. Ryder turned around and stared into the dark as he heard metallic footsteps inching closer. He focused his eyes and saw blue light in the distance. Robodog? He shouted in excitement as he noticed the robotic dog walking closer to him. 
Boy, am I glad to see... His excitement changed to worry as he realized something. Wait. I don't remember activating you, he said with wide eyes. As Robodog inched closer, Ryder's pup pad began to ring. It's working now? Ryder said to himself, completely confused. He fumbled around in his pockets before pulling the device out. As he gazed at the screen, his expression became even more confused to see a cartoon bloody skull icon as the pup pad continued to ring. He hesitated a moment before answering. Once he answered, Video Feed of Bloodbeard appeared on the screen. The pirate just stood there in one spot, breathing heavily for what seemed like minutes before the pup pad shut off again. Ryder had never been more freaked out than now. His state of shock caused him to drop the pup pad to the ground, shattering the screen in the process. Robodog lunged at Ryder, biting his ankle, ripping through his pants leg, and drawing blood. Ryder grunted in pain. He kicked his leg and sent Robodog sailing across the floor. The cybernetic dog hopped back on its feet, yipping and wagging its tail before charging at the boy again. Robodog, stop! Ryder commanded while clenching his heart ankle. The command did not register. Ryder quickly dodged and rolled as Robodog tried to attack him once again, just barely missing his arm. Ryder knew that he couldn't disable the cybernetic dog without his remote. And even if he had the remote, it wouldn't do much good. He stared at his hand, which was printed with blood from his ankle. Robodog attacked once more, this time making contact with Ryder's leg and taking a huge chunk of flesh. Ugh. Ryder uttered through gritted teeth. The immense pain caused beads of tears to form in his eyes. He was immediately starting to regret his decision of telling the pups to leave. He needed help, and the situation was only starting to look more bleak. Robodog launched himself towards Ryder's face, with blood trickling down his metallic mouth. Ryder caught him with both hands, just before Robodog could snap at his face. But the impact caused him to fall onto his back. The metallic monster continued its assault, trying to bite and nip any part of the ten-year-old as Ryder struggled to continue holding him while lying on the floor. Is this it? He thought. I never would have imagined that it would end like this. I'm sorry, Chase. Rocky, Zuma, Sky, Marshall, and especially you, Rebel. At that moment, something clicked within Ryder. No! Using all of his strength, Ryder threw Robodog with a great amount of force, causing him to collide with a wall a few feet away. Of course, it didn't take the electronic menace long to recover. Ryder, clutching his bleeding leg, quickly limped back over to the entrance doors and picked up his pup pad. Robodog was already heading straight for him. Ryder held the pup pad with both hands, positioning himself in a batter-ready stance. I'm sorry to do this to you, he said, but I won't let you tear me away from them. Robodog jumped up towards Ryder's face again. Ryder swung the pup pad with all his might. The pup pad made direct contact with Robodog's head. The metallic menace, along with a grip of glass shards, went spiraling in the air across the room and smashed into a wall. Robodog fell to the floor from the wall. His eye visor blinked a few times before shutting off. Ryder dropped his pup pad to the floor and breathed heavily. He had survived the assault of one of his greatest and most loved creations, but the cost of living came from destroying it. I suppose I could always build a second version, he said while staring at the floor. He closed his eyes and sighed in relief. At that moment, Robodog's visor blinked back on, and not a second later, his jetpack activated. 
He shot through the air towards Ryder with great speed. Ryder gasped and looked up with wide eyes. Robodog bit Ryder's neck while passing and ripped his head clear off his shoulders with a powerful force. The metallic monster then smashed into the entrance doors with the impact so great that its metallic body completely shattered, causing it to drop Ryder's severed head to the floor. Ryder's headless body spewed from the top like a volcano as it fell to the floor, already forming a giant puddle. His head was placed a few feet away, bearing the same wide-eyed expression he had just before the murderous monster decapitated him. Katie's eyes shot open wide as she sat up dressed in pajamas in her bed breathing heavily. She reached over and turned on her lamp. What a nightmare, she said aloud. I hope you're having better dreams than me, she said as she turned to look at Callie. Callie wasn't there. Callie? Katie called as she began to look in all directions of the room. The lamp then shut off. Those who gaze at the moon as I pass shall soon find that night to be their last, uttered a voice that was very unfamiliar to Katie. Katie jumped as she pulled up her covers. Who's there? She asked a little too panicked. I must still be dreaming. She thought to herself. Katie. Called a voice. Katie. Katie got out of her bed with a confused expression and walked to the doorway as she recognized the voice that was calling her. Rubble? She said, staring out into the darkness. Katie, come here. Me and Callie have a surprise for you. <laughs> As the blood moon hovered in the night sky, Chase, ears flowing in the wind, drove as fast as he could to reach his destination. Sky was quiet in the back. A lot of things going through her mind. This night, it's a complete nightmare, she said aloud. I keep hoping, hoping that I'll wake up and all of us will be back at the lookout. That rubble will still be with us. Although Chase had said that he wanted to talk to her about something, he couldn't bring himself to. Too many thoughts were running through his mind as well. Would Ryder be okay? Would the others be safe? Would he be able to save anyone at all? And most importantly, would he be able to protect Sky? He was working up the courage to say something until Sky continued. And I can't help but wonder, which one of us will be next? She said. Her last statement really hit Chase hard. He didn't know how to respond to that. How could he truly assure her that everything would be all right? Sky, the thought of losing you, he swallowed, scares me. That's not to say that I don't care about the others, but I really care about you, Chase said. Aw, Chase, that's so sweet. I care about you too, replied Sky, completely oblivious to what he truly meant. Chase huffed, continuing to focus on the road. Sky, what I wanted to talk to you about, I really care about you, Chase emphasized. Chase, you said that already. I care about you more than myself, he unintentionally interrupted. Sky was now finally starting to get the picture of what he was saying. Chase's face was flushed red as he took a deep breath and continued. I think of you every day. I worry myself to death whenever you're in trouble. I keep your old bathing cap just because it smells like you. Wait, ignore that last part. The best part of my days are the times we get to hang out. I love when we play pup-up boogie together. 
I love when we go on missions and me and you pair up. I love your smile and laugh and the way you do flips. I love everything about you, Sky. Chase finished, out of breath, as Mr. Porter's house began to come into view. Sky sat there, a little dumbfounded. Because I love you, Chase said as he gained his breath back. Chase's last statement caused Sky's eyes to shoot open as memories came flooding back to her. Sky! Sky, I'm glad you're okay. Sky, you're safe. N not that I was worried or anything. Ryder, she made it. Sky made it. Be careful, Sky. Chase was worried about you, Sky. These memories caused realization to set on Sky. Chase, she thought at a loss for words. In her mind, she had never really considered anyone on her team to be more than just a friend. But for some reason, Chase confessing these feelings for her made her feel something towards him. Chase nervously waited for her to say something, anything. Instead, he was greeted by a tight hug from behind him. Skye embraced him tightly, small drops of tears hanging onto her eyes. Chase's cheeks bursted with red color again, but he quickly relaxed himself. Skye ended the embrace as the two pulled into Mr. Porter's yard and stared at the house before them. For some strange reason, many crows were perched atop the house. The birds seemed to watch the two as they slowly stepped out of the cruiser. As the two pups looked from the outside, they couldn't help but notice that no lights were on in the inside. I don't think this is a good sign, uttered the shivering sky. Ruff! Heat vision goggles, Chase commanded as the green visor on his spy helmet dropped down over his eyes. He scanned the house for any heat signatures that he could find. There, he said as he came across two within the house. Sky, you should stay out here, he told her with a worried look on his face. You'll be safer outside. Sky was about to argue, but decided against it. Even though he didn't want her to go in the house with him, she didn't want him to go in alone. But Chase, what about you? She said. Don't worry about me, he said with a serious expression. I'll protect you. I promise. He turned to walk off, but was stopped by Sky. He turned to face her, only to be met by a kiss. As Sky pulled away, Chase had a dazed expression with cheeks so red that one would think the pup had a high fever. Sky wanted to giggle at this, but didn't because of the seriousness of the situation. Be careful, Chase, she said to him, snapping him out of his heavenly moment. Chase furiously shook his head, coming back to reality. He looked up to Sky and smiled sweetly and nodded. I will. He walked up to the house door and stood on his hind legs as he turned the knob. It's unlocked? As he opened the door, all that light ahead of him was darkness. Woof! Night vision goggles! Katie slowly walked down the dark hallway. She couldn't figure out what in the world Rubble would be doing in her house this late at night and why he and Callie wanted to surprise her. None of this made sense to her at all. I must still be dreaming, she thought to herself as she felt her way through the pitch black hallway. Rubble, can you or Callie at least turn on the light? No answer was heard. Rubble? She called out to the voice again. Still no answer was heard. Katie huffed and continued to feel her way through the dark until the walls expanded and she was unknowingly in the center of a spacious room. She continued to walk until she bumped her head into something hanging from the ceiling and slipped and fell to the floor. What in the world? She asked while rubbing her behind. What did I slip in? It's so wet. She fell all over her now drenched pajamas. She began to smell something strange. Rubble, are you still there? Can you turn on the lights? Katie asked, 
In response a few seconds later, a dim light had flicked on. Katie's eyes grew wide as she stared at her PJs covered in a dark red substance. Is this? She looked to the floor and saw that what she had slipped in was a puddle of the red substance. Her breathing started to become shallow seconds before a drop of the red substance fell from above her. She slowly looked up. <coughs> Hovering above her was Callie, hanging from the chandelier by a worn out leash tied around her neck. Her eyes were wide open and she was missing the lower half of her body. No. No. No, 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 Callie! She wept. She didn't know how or why this happened, but she just wept. Katie, you're next, said the voice as its pitch deepened with the last word. Katie didn't know what else to do except run. She made a dash for the front door and tried to exit. The knob wouldn't budge. Help! Somebody! She desperately began to pound on the door with her hands and fists. From a shadowy corner, the silhouette of a bulldog began to walk forward and change shape into a pirate wielding a sharp hook. Katie screamed and banged louder as he began to close in on her. He raised his bloody hook. A green recycling truck crashed through the wall and windows, screeching on brakes as it pulled up by Katie. Rocky looked up from his now scuffed and heavily dented truck to see the pirate picking himself off of the floor a few feet away. He studied the features of the scurvy man and especially noted the red pupilless eye and bloody hook and beard. Rocky's eyes widened in shock. <sighs> Is that... Bloodbeard? He asked as courage began to fade away. He looked towards the ceiling to see the horrible sight of Callie dangling. No, he uttered out. Callie, I was too late to save them both. He thought to himself, trying to blink back the tears that were forming. Snapping out of his trance, he turned towards Katie. Katie, hop on! The blonde didn't waste a second as she stepped onto the arms of the recycling truck and climbed up to Rocky's seat, crouching behind it. Rocky hit the gas and swung the truck around in a U-turn, heading out of the same entrance that he had made. Katie looked behind her to see if they were being followed by the ghost pirate. Fortunately, there wasn't a trace of him behind them. As Katie stared at her house shrinking in the distance, she faced forward covering her eyes in tears. Rocky, Callie, she, she was. Katie cut herself off as she cried. Why, why, why? Rocky couldn't bear to see her cry. He knew the feeling of losing someone all too well. He knew there was nothing he could say to make her feel better. He tapped his pup tag. Guys, I have Katie with me. I was able to save her, Rocky said, speaking through his tag in a shaky voice. Chase exhaled in relief as he stopped walking through the dark house for a moment. That's great news. How are Katie and Callie? He asked. Rocky hesitated as he lowered his head in shame. I only have Katie with me, he answered. So, where's Callie? Skye asked, curious. There was a moment of silence before the other four pups could hear Katie's now loud cries. They were able to place the pieces together. Has any pup else found one of the others? Asked Zuma. Me and Marshall still haven't reached Cabin Tebbets yet. Me and Sky are at the porters now. I'm searching for two heat signatures as we speak. Answered Chase. And no one's heard word from Ryder yet? Asked Marshall. 
The others were all silent for a second. No. Responded Chase. I'm going to head back to the lookout to check on hit. No. Rocky was cut off by Chase. You need to get Katie out of town. You don't know what you'll find there. Said the shepherd. Chase. Rocky looked horrified. I'm sorry, Rocky. But it's just as I said earlier. We have to complete the mission. A tear could be spotted rolling down from his night vision goggles. The longer Katie is in town, the longer she could be in danger. I understand, replied Rocky. I'll take Katie to Foggy. Ah! Rocky jerked his steering wheel as he swerved out of the way of the pirate who had appeared right in front of him. Katie screamed. Rocky, what's going on? Chase called over the speaker. The ghost pirate found us. He replied back. Seconds passed, and there was no response back to Rocky from the other end. Chase? Still no response was heard. Sky? Zuma? Marshall? He looked down at his pup tab for a second to see that it was no longer lit. He furiously tapped it to try and get it to activate, but it was no use. Why? Why is this happening? He yelled as he slammed his paw on the dashboard of his truck. Rocky? Rocky, answer me! Chase yelled through his pup tag. The only response he received was a few seconds of eerie heavy breathing before it stopped. Rocky! Come on, dude, answer us! Are you alright? The other three called out to the mixed breed as well. Their worry only ensued as the silence continued. Rocky laid on the gas, not letting up as he kept watch behind him. His heart felt like it was about to jump out of his chest. He looked back and forth, searching for where the ghost pirate might jump out next, with Katie searching as well, despite her being short on breath from screaming. The ruby red moon that seemed to follow them looked as if it was taunting them. He rushed past City Hall, still keeping eyes peeled behind him. As he looked back to the front, Bloodbeard stood in his path once more. Yeah! He screamed, once again swerving around the ghost pirate. This time, however, the speed and force of the swerve caused the recycling truck to flip over. Katie screamed as the motions threw her off the truck before the side of it slammed onto the road, creating a loud screeching noise. Rocky's truck, still skidding on its side, crashed into a streetlight pole. The impact knocked him unconscious. Marshall was flying down the road in his EMT truck. His eyes may have been fixed on the road, but his mind was in an entirely different location. He was supposed to be with Chase right now, not that he had a problem with Zuma or anything. It's just that if he had to die, he would rather it be by Chase's side. Instead, Sky would be the one by Chase's side and under his protection. Marshall knew exactly what Chase wanted to talk to her about, and he couldn't help feeling a little hurt at the fact that Chase switched him out. Ryder told Chase to pair up with him. Chase had never undermined Ryder's orders before. But now here he was undermining orders just to be with Sky. Thinking of this caused Marshall to let out a huge sigh. Marshall, you okay, dude? Marshall was knocked out of his thoughts by the chocolate lab driving up beside him. Yeah, Marshall replied. I was just kind of lost in thought there. I hear you. I can't stop thinking about walkie, Zuma said, the worry clear in his eyes. I'm worried about everyone, said Marshall. We don't know what happened to Rocky. We don't know what happened to Ryder. We don't even know what's going to happen to us. Losing Rubble was hard enough, and I... I... I just don't know how much more of this I can take. Zuma just stared sadly at the Dalmatian. Marshall wasn't the only one feeling this way. They all felt the same. The walls were closing in sealing off all hope that might have been shining through the crevices 
This nightmare night was taking its toll. I know what you mean. We didn't do anything wrong. We don't deserve this. Any of this, Zuma answered. The drive to Captain Turbot seemed to go on forever. The two couldn't help but wonder how the others were doing. Sky sat outside of the porter's house, watching the crows. The black bird seemed to stare at the cockapoo in an eerie fashion. Sky started to feel slightly uneasy as more crows began to gather and land atop the porter's house. Even though these birds weren't eagles, she still got that certain shiver from them. On top of being creepy, they were still bigger than her. She moved a shaky paw to tap her pup tag. Ch Chase? Have you found them yet? She asked. No, not yet, replied the shepherd searching the house. He looked from side to side. My goggles picked up two heat signatures, but now that I'm in the house, I can't seem to see them anymore. He sighed. Not only that, but I can't seem to focus. I keep thinking about what might have happened to Rocky. I just wish there was a way to see where he is. An idea suddenly came to Chase's mind. That's it. Sky, use my drone. Launch it and tell it to find Rocky. Chase told her through his pup tag. You should be able to see everything the drone sees on the monitor. Sky nodded and she quickly ran back to Chase's spy cruiser. She looked confused at all the various buttons on the control panel. Okay, now how do you work this thing? She said to herself. She's seen Chase work it a few times, but not enough times to have it completely memorized. She tapped a few random buttons, and the holder for the drone extended from the top of the vehicle. Nailed it, she said triumphantly. Arf! Deploy drone! Launch! She commanded. The drone shot out from the holder and began to soar in the air, flying in circles. Sky, watching this, tilted her head a little confused. Why isn't it going anywhere? She stared at it for a few more seconds before she mentally smacked herself. Oh, that's right, she muttered out. She remembered that she had to give the drone a command after it's launched. Find Rocky, she yelled into the air. The drone registered the command and quickly took off into the distance. Sky turned her attention back to the monitor on the back of Chase's vehicle. She watched the view through the surveillance of the drone, looking for any sign or sight of her friend. Back inside the porter's house, Chase was sniffing around the hallways until he picked up a familiar scent. This is Alex's scent, he said to himself. He followed the scent through the hallway until he came to a hatch embedded into the floor. Chase opened the hatch to find stairs that led to some kind of dark basement. He winced as the smell of burning flesh filled his nose. This doesn't seem like a good sign, he said, walking down the stairs. Their scent is strong down here. Were they trying to hide? Chase stepped onto the basement floor and saw a furnace against the wall. He continued to sniff the floor, looking for clues. But the floor was so dusty that he immediately started sneezing. His nose led him to the furnace where the smell of burning flesh, along with the scent of the porters, was the strongest. Chase got a bad feeling in his stomach as he walked closer to the furnace. He sniffed near the flames, and his eyes became wide. He looked around the basement for anything that he could fill with water. He grabbed a nearby pail atop a dusty table and ran to the nearest source of water to fill it up. After doing so, he ran back into the basement and up to the furnace. He doused the water into the furnace, and the large flames sizzled out, making smoke cover the room. Chase covered his muzzle with his arm and let out a few coughs. When the smoke began to clear, he walked back up to the furnace and peered inside. It was just as he feared. The furnace was littered with extremely burned and severed limbs, limbs that carried the scent of both Alex and Mr. Porter. 
Chase removed his spy helmet and bowed his head, giving the two a moment of silence. In Chase's mind, Alex was always somewhat annoying, but he didn't hate him, and he certainly wouldn't wish this on him. Alex looked up to them after all. Mr. Porter was very loved by all the pups. He never failed to give them treats, fruits, or desserts every now and then, and was such a kind and gentle man. How am I going to tell Skye that we were too late? How am I going to tell the others that we failed? Skye continued to watch the drone monitor. She could still feel the beady eyes of the crows watching her. The monitor started to get fuzzier and fuzzier. That's not supposed to happen, she said to herself. It wasn't long before the drone's view completely faded from the monitor. Suddenly, Skye's ears picked up the sound of flapping close by. When she turned her head to look, she saw the crows that were previously watching her take flight into the air, circling just above her. She began to feel even more uneasy as countless more groups of crows joined in. The pitch black birds swarmed above her like a tornado preparing to touch down. There were so many of them, the sound of heavy breathing reached her ears and she turned around to look behind her. She looked at the monitor in shock as it blinked back and forth from static to an image of Bloodbeard. Those who gaze at the moon as I pass shall soon find that night to be their last. Sky immediately took off running after hearing the voice. The large flock of crows proceeded to pursue her. Chase! They're after me! I need help! Sky yelled through a pup tag. What's happening? Who's after you? Chase asked, the worry clear in his voice. It's the crows! They're chasing me! I, I heard the voice and saw the ghost! Before she could even finish the sentence, Chase dropped his helmet and was already dashing back up the basement stairs and through the dark hallways on his way to the exit. No, please, not her, he thought to himself. Faster, I need to go faster. He thrusted his legs out, picking up speed. Sky was running as fast as her little legs would take her. She tried her hardest not to look back. But when she did, four crows swooped down from the flock above her and lashed onto her ears with their beaks. They yanked her high into the sky while she screamed. They took her higher and higher. No matter how hard she tried, she couldn't break free from their strong beaks. She watched as the ground had continued to shrink. Where are you taking me? She asked them. The answer that she demanded was not given. As the crows soared high above the clouds, they released the cockapoo, and she began plummeting to the ground at a fast rate. She continued to scream. Chase, who had just made it out the front door, watched in horror as she fell from the sky a distance away from him. He sprinted in her direction as quickly as he could. Please make it, please make it, he repeated. Sky could only watch as the ground grew closer. Arf! Net! Chase shot out his net towards Sky. Horror had filled him as Sky hit the ground before the net could catch her. No! Chase cried out, stopping in his tracks. Sky grunted as pain coursed through her entire body. She felt as though she had broken a few bones. The crows then swooped down in a tornado and surrounded Sky, assaulting her. They continuously pecked at her, accidentally pecking her pup tag, activating it. All the others could now hear her screams through their pup tags. A crow plucked out her eye, while another nipped off her nose. Numerous flocks of crows pecked and pulled off every part of the pain cockapoo. Chase rushed over towards her, tears filling his eyes. No! Not her! Not her! He kept yelling. He rushed into the swarm biting, kicking, and smacking any bird in sight while he tried to reach the cockapoo. The birds attacked on the female didn't waver, nor did they turn their attention to Chase or attack him. Chase wasn't giving up. He continued to inch his way through the swarm. He could no longer see Sky. The only thing in sight 
was a bundle of crows flapping and pecking their prey. The flock slowly calmed and they began to cease their attacks on the female. Chase ran to the remaining flock that covered where Sky was and released his fury on them, biting, stomping, and pummeling them fiercely. The other crows saw this and scattered away into the sky in panic. Chase looked in front of him and stood shivering. Sky? Was that you screaming? Is everything alright? Marshall's voice rang from her pup tag. Sky? Sky, are you there? The dolly received no answer. Chase, are you there? Zuma asked the shepherd as Chase's tag lit up. Chase, did something happen? Dude, come on, answer me! He pleaded, yet he still received silence. Chase just stared as if he was put in a trance. He stared at Skye's bloody collar. He stared at her flashing pup tag. He stared at her scattered fur and ripped aviator cap. He stared at her no longer visible body. All that remained were her goggles and tiny pieces of flesh. He didn't cry. He didn't whimper. He didn't cringe. He just stared, broken and numb to the world around him. Marshall had a bad feeling in the pit of his stomach. Why wouldn't she respond? He pondered to himself. Sky screamed like she was in trouble. And what was with all the bird noises? What happened? All these questions and more ran through his mind as he and Zuma closed in on the dock. They looked around to see that Captain Turbot's boat was nowhere in sight. Zuma focused his eyes over the waves in the distance. He was able to spot a ship far out in the sea near a little island with a lighthouse. There! He's on Seal Island, said Zuma. Hop on my hovercraft. We'll have to cross the ocean. Marshall gulped. For some reason, crossing the ocean on a night like this just didn't sit right with him. He jumped out of his EMT truck and slowly walked over to the hovercraft. He hesitated for a moment. What's wrong? Zuma asked him. Nothing, Marshall said, shaking his head. He decided to push the thoughts away. Marshall reached out his paw to Zuma, and the lab helped him into the back seat of the hovercraft. Once Marshall was seated and buckled in, Zuma took off, picking up speed across the sand and zoomed off into the ocean. The two watched the waters and how the blood moon reflected on the surface of it. Even on a night like this, all seemed calm with the ocean. Despite the situation, seeing this calmness within the ocean relaxed Zuma a little. He loved the ocean, and the serenity and peace within it always calmed him down. As Marshall stared at the reflection of the blood moon, he noticed something disappear around the borders of the moon. He looked to the sky and noticed something that he hadn't before. There were red stars surrounding the moon, four in total. The red stars were tiny, but still noticeable. Zuma, do you see that? Marshall asked Zuma, causing him to look up. Yeah, that's the blood moon, remember? It's been there all night. No, not that. I'm talking about those tiny stars going around it, Marshall said, pointing. Zuma squinted his eyes, looking closer, and he did indeed see the stars. I see them. They're wed. Just like the moon, replied Zuma. Not only that, those four stars are the only red ones in the entire sky, Marshall added. What do you think it means? Zuma asked. I don't know, answered Marshall. The hovercraft began to close in on the island. After riding on shore, Marshall and Zuma hurriedly jumped out of the hovercraft. They stared at a ship floating near the shore a distance away from them. It was the same ship that they were supposed to have the Halloween party on. Marshall, taking the quiet scene in, felt an unusual chill. 
Something just seems eerie here, he said. What do you mean? Zuma asked, turning to look at him. It's just so quiet. Too quiet. It makes me feel uneasy, Marshall answered. Zuma proceeded to walk over to the boat, and Marshall followed behind. They walked up the wooden ramp of the ship and onto the deck. Decorations from the party they were supposed to have still hung around the ship. The two approached the back end of the deck and knocked on the entrance door to the inner parts of the ship. No one answered. Zuma decided to pull on the door to see if it was unlocked, and surely enough, it was. He opened the door, and they walked in. The inside of the ship was actually bigger than it looked from the outside. There was even a wooden staircase that led down deeper into the ship. Tiny lanterns were hung on the walls. Captain Torbit? Zuma called as they carefully inched down the creaking stairs. C Captain Turbot? Marshall called as well. As they walked deeper down the stairs, they noticed that the lower part of the staircase had no lanterns on the walls. Near the bottom of the stairs, there was a dim light coming from around the corner. The two could hear noises, as if someone was chopping something up. Marshall and Zuma gulped. C Captain Turbot? Zuma called as they walked down the last of the stairs. In here, guys, called the captain from around the corner. The pups were relieved and surprised to hear his voice. Once they had gotten to the bottom of the staircase, around the corner was a small kitchen area. Wow, Captain Tubbit, I didn't know your ship had a secret kitchen, Zuma said, looking impressed. Captain Turbot had his back turned to them while he stood chopping something on the counter. He chuckled. <laughs> well, there's a lot of things that you don't know, he answered, his back still turned to them. Uh, Captain Turbot, we really need you to come with us, Marshall said, interrupting the small talk. This is going to sound crazy, but there's this ghost pirate that's going around killing everyone. Captain Turbot chuckled once more while still chopping. Oh, I wouldn't find that hard to believe, he replied. The two pups found his behavior to be very strange. He continued to chop the unknown object. This made Marshall curious, and as a result, he began to slowly walk forward to get a better view of what the captain was doing. As he walked past the side counter, something caught his eye. He quickly looked over and gasped. Captain Turbot's orange knitted cap laid on the floor in a crimson trail. Marshall, eyes wide, began to shiver. Z Z Zuma, Marshall whispered out. Zuma walked over to where the Dalmatian stood. What's wrong? he asked. The lab soon got his answer as Marshall pointed in the direction of the cap. Zuma's heart stopped. C Captain Turbot? Why is there blood on your cap? The lab asked, spooked. The captain didn't reply. He just continued to chop while humming in an eerie fashion. Marshall and Zuma slowly walked to the cap and peeked behind the counter. Behind that very counter laid Cap and Turbot. The two pups' stomachs grew weak as they struggled to hold their vomit in their mouth. Looking at Cap and Turbot, he had been completely dissected. His innards were splattered out with a few organs still being connected to his body. As they gazed at the gruesome and horrific sight, they could still hear the other Cap and Turbot humming and shopping on the cutting board until his head turned around 180 degrees to reveal a red, pupilless eyeball and an expressionless face. Marshall and Zuma screamed, holding onto one another while he continued to hum and chop down on the now visible object. It appeared to be a heart, a human heart. The two pups wasted no time in bailing. 
They quickly ran out of the kitchen and fumbled up the staircase. The ghost didn't seem to be chasing them, but that fact didn't slow them down. They exited the ship, dashing down the ramp, but Marshall tripped and tumbled down the wooden ramp and into the sand. Marshall! Zuma called. Making his way down, he helped him up after reaching the bottom and the two made way for the hovercraft. They were in such a panic that when they hopped in, they didn't even bother buckling up. Zuma started the hovercraft and took off in the ocean, heading back towards the town. The ghost pirate appeared on the shore that they had just left. Those who gaze at the moon as I pass shall soon find that night to be their last, he said before vanishing. Zuma's hovercraft hummed as it raced across the water. Marshall, he was gutted like a fish. Zuma couldn't believe what happened to Captain Turbot. He and the captain had a lot in common when it came to the sea. They both shared a deep interest and love in it. Now the only person he could relate to about such things was gone. The chocolate lab felt tears slipping down his cheeks. Marshall noticed this and gave him a gentle hug from behind. He couldn't find the words to say. Marshall let go of him as both of their ears picked up a splashing sound behind them. Marshall gasped and quickly turned around. His body froze upon what he saw. A giant black fin heading towards them at a great speed. Zuma! Zuma! Marshall called, shaking him. As Zuma turned around, the fin sunk back into the ocean before he could see it. What? Was it the ghost pirate? Is he still following us? He asked Marshall, panicked. It was a giant shark. It was following us. Marshall answered, looking equally terrified. A shark? We've never seen a shark in this ocean before, said Zuma. I didn't actually see it. Just the fin. But I'm sure that's what it was, answered Marshall. Zuma looked side to side of the hovercraft, but saw nothing. Keep an eye out for it, and hang on. Zuma pressed down on the gas and sped the hovercraft up. Marshall, although scared, did as he was told. When he looked upon the waters, all he could see was the red tint and reflection from the blood moon. He wouldn't give up. He narrowed his eyes and concentrated hard from a distance. Watching behind them, the shark suddenly sprung out from the front of the hovercraft. Whoa! Zuma was able to duck just in time as a great white shark jumped up before snapping at him and completely diving over the two. Marshall wasn't exaggerating when he called the shark giant. In fact, calling it giant was a complete understatement. Though the two have never really seen a shark up close and personal like this, the great white dove back into the ocean creating a massive shockwave on the surface of the waters, creating waves that shook the hovercraft violently. The... That thing was huge! Zuma said, trying to gain back control of the craft. Marshall didn't say a thing. He just laid low, covering his head while his teeth chattered. Marshall, can you see it? He called out. Marshall shut his eyes tight and continued shivering. Marshall! No. I'm too scared. I don't want to get eaten. Marshall whispered. Zuma scoffed at the situation that they were put in. This didn't look good at all. Marshall, please. I need to focus on getting us back to the shore safe. I need you to keep looking out for- <laughs> Zuma's sentence was cut short as the ginormous great white tore through a part of the hovercraft with its powerful jaws. The craft, now damaged and unbalanced, began to capsize over into the ocean, taking both pups down with it. Marshall struggled to breathe as he was already quickly running out of air as he sunk deeper into the crimson-like ocean. 
Zuma watched as the Dalmatian began to slip out of consciousness. Thinking quickly, he wasted no time activating his pup pack and oxygen mask and made straight for Marshall. He grabbed Marshall around the waist, removed his oxygen breather, and gave it to his drowning friend. Zuma adjusted the breather on Marshall's mouth before activating the jet propeller mode on his pup pack and heading towards the surface. Stay with me, dude. We can't lose you. Zuma looked around for any sign of the titanic beast, but he couldn't find even a trace of it. Where'd that thing go? Something that big shouldn't be able to hide. Unless... Zuma looked below him, and surely enough, a wide mouth with sharp teeth was speeding toward him from the deep. He was able to dodge the massive jaws just in time and swam to the surface. Still toting Marshall, he quickly made his way for the beach shores. Just a little closer. Why can't this thing go any faster? The tall fin was speeding towards Zuma and the safety of the shore seemed miles away. Zuma's legs were starting to get tired as he had been kicking them to swim faster in tandem with his pup pack. He continued to hold on to Marshall tightly. His breathing was becoming heavy, but he focused his eyes on the approaching shore. I won't give up, not with Marshall on the line. Zuma bared his teeth and kicked his legs as fast as he could, greatly increasing his speed. Soon, he was able to create a wide distance between himself and the titanic fin. The Great White tried to shorten the distance by lunging at the lab, but missed. The force of the shark crashing into the water next to Zuma caused a wave to form and pushed Zuma and Marshall the rest of the distance to the shore. The force of the shark crashing into the water next to Zuma caused the wave to form and pushed Zuma and Marshall the rest of the distance to the shore. Marshall slipped out of Zuma's hold and both of them landed in the shallow water. Marshall coughed up water and slowly opened his eyes. Huh? Where are we? Where's the shark? He asked, looking around. We're back on shore, Zuma answered. He was lying in the shallow water, completely exhausted. But the last thing I remember is falling into the ocean. Marshall turned his attention towards Zuma. Did you save me? He asked. Zuma chuckled. <laughs> Barely. You really need to lay out the pup treats, he said, smiling at Marshall. Thanks, Zuma. I thought I was a goner, he said, looking down. Hey, we're a team, and you're my friend. I couldn't just leave you behind. <laughs> the great white sprang from the ocean and onto the shallow water catching the lower part of Zuma's body in its teeth. Zuma yelled out in pain. Marshall looked shocked. The shark proceeded to try and wiggle its way back into the ocean with Zuma in tow. Marshall! Zuma called out to the Dalmatian, reaching out for him. Marshall snapped out of it and ran to him. Grabbing both of Zuma's paws, he tried to pull him from the shark's mouth. No! No! Marshall yelled with tears in his eyes. The shark was pulling him along with Zuma. Zuma, no! We can't lose you! It's okay, Marshall. I'll be fine. Marshall looked at him with wide, tearful eyes. If you don't let go, you'll die too, Zuma said, trying to be strong for his friend. Zuma! You have to protect the others. Zuma yanked his paws from Marshall just before the great white wiggled back into the ocean with him. Marshall ran to the end of the shallow water and stared into the deep. He watched as crimson liquid began to surface to the top and let a tear slip into the ocean. In the reflection of the water, he watched as another red star faded out of sight from around the blood moon, leaving only three remaining stars. Zuma! His voice echoed across the seas. He bawled and pounded the water mercilessly. Come back, Zuma. Zuma. As Marshall continued to grieve, 
He didn't even notice his pup tag light up. Can anyone hear me? Spoke a familiar but raspy voice. Need help. Marshall, need you. Downtown. Truck totaled. Katie injured. Need medical attention. Rocky laid on the ground near his overturned truck in pain. Using his remaining energy, he tried to stand, but winced when he applied pressure to his hind legs. There was a sharp pain that seemed to be coming from the left hind leg. He looked over his surroundings. His recycling truck was definitely in bad shape. The front was completely mashed in. There were huge dings and dents all over the back, and the vehicle was missing a wheel. He was able to spot Katie lying on the ground not far from the truck and began limping in her direction. Katie! He tried to call to her, his voice still raspy. Katie! He gently shook her, trying to wake her up, yet she was unresponsive. Katie! Wake up! Still no response. He placed a paw on her wrist to try and feel her pulse. Oh no. His eyes widened. Katie, please don't be... Marshall had left the beach long ago. He was completely broken and vulnerable now, having to watch not one, but two of his friends die. He blamed himself for Zuma's death. If he had kept a lookout like Zuma told him, instead of cowering, he would still be here. Not to mention, he would still be there if he didn't have to come back for Marshall. It's all my fault. He got eaten because of me. The guilt was eating the Dalmatian alive, slowly making him go insane. He knew that Zuma always used to say that if he had to go that he would rather take eternal rest in a deep blue. But the way that he was taken away surely wasn't one that he imagined before. Marshall was at the point where he wanted to escape this night. He just wanted it all to end. I can't take this anymore. I just can't. He slammed his paw on his dashboard. Why us? Why? Huh, Bloodbeard? We've never done anything wrong. Tears began to escape him again. Zuma, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. As he continued to mentally beat himself up, his pup tag lit up, and Rocky's voice came from the other end. Everyone, I'm sorry. I wasn't able to protect Katie. His voice sounded shaky. I need... I need you all to meet me at the park. Come as fast as you can. It's urgent. Rocky was the first to arrive at the park, as he was the closest one. With his recycling truck totaled, he had to limp the entire way there. He waited for the others, and sometime shortly after, Marshall pulled up in his EMT truck. An expression of total defeat surrounded his features. Chase was next to come. He slowly disembarked his vehicle, staring at the pink pup tag and collar he held in his paws, not looking up once. Rocky quickly noticed the spirit-breaking expressions on their faces, as well as the other missing members of the party. A grim realization started to seep in. Where... Where are Sky and Zuma? He hesitantly asked. Neither pup could face him or speak. Guys, stop fooling around here. Tears started to fill the mixed breed's eyes. Where are they? Where are they? As the other two bowed their heads in depression, Rocky's answer 
was confirmed. No. We, we can't be the only ones left. We just can't. He ran up to Marshall. Marshall, please tell me Zuma's still out there. This has to be a joke. Where is he? He began to shout. Give him back! Give him back! Give him back! Rocky fully bursts out into tears, bawling freely on Marshall's chest. Marshall placed an arm around him to comfort him, trying hard not to join him in his teary parade. It was plainly clear the pups were defeated, broken, spiritless. In a way, they were already dead. Bloodbeard had won. If there was any chance for survival, the three would have to leave town, and fast. We... we have to leave Adventure Bay, Rocky said. We have to get somewhere safe, whether it's Foggy Bottom or Carlos Jungle. We just have to leave. What's the point? Chase mumbled out, still staring at the pink collar within his paw. There was nothing but emptiness in his eyes and voice. There's nothing left for us. Everyone else is gone. Even Ryder. The Paw Patrol is over. Even if we survive this night, I don't think I could go on. Just to stop feeling this pain. I'd rather Bloodbeard just stab through my heart right now! He raised his voice. Marshall and Rocky looked at him in shock. Chase! You don't mean that. Marshall told him. Yes, I do! That monster! He took Sky right in front of my eyes! Chase was now pouring out tears. After I had just told her how I felt. After I told her I loved her! He fell to the ground, sobbing loudly. I just can't... Go on. I can't live with the images of her death. He covered his ears. I can't live with the sound of her voice. Her voice, begging me, pleading me to save her. And I failed! I failed! I failed! I failed! Chase wailed and wailed, projecting deep emotions, letting out everything he held in, the moment of Sky's death. Rocky and Marshall could only watch in heartbreak. I deserve to die! I deserve to die! There's nothing left! There's no one left! Marshall had heard enough. He quickly got closer to Chase. He raised his paw and smacked Chase with all his strength. <laughs> Rocky gasped at this. Chase, confused by the impact, looked up, rubbing his cheek, and saw a teary-eyed Dalmatian before him. Chase... You idiot! You're only hurting us by saying these things! Hurting me! Rocky and me! We both care about you! You have us left! You have me left! Am I not a good enough reason for you to survive? Do I really mean nothing to you? Marshall's expression was a combination of anger, sorrow, and hurt. Chase continued to stare at Marshall in surprise. Why was he saying all these things? Chase couldn't come to any conclusion. Marshall, what are you- Those who gaze at the moon as I pass shall soon find that night to be their last. All eyes opened wide in horror at the sound of the voice. An eerie wind blew around the three, surrounding them, filling them with dread as it moved all over the park. A tall figure appeared out in the distance and began to slowly walk toward the three. Long, ebony hair moving with the wind. The figure came closer. It was none other than the ghost pirate himself. Bloodbeard. No. Not now. Rocky's voice shivered as he trembled with fear. As the ghost pirate continued to move towards them, the horrific memories of Sky flashed through Chase's mind. He could feel something burning up inside him. Anger. Sadness. Hate. We have to go, now! Rocky shouted. Before he could even finish his sentence, Chase had already started charging toward the pirate. 
Chase, stop! Marshall called out to him, but Chase didn't stop. He was locked in a mode of fury and rage. He bared his teeth as he closed in on Bloodbeard. The pirate drew back his arm and swung his hook at the shepherd. Chase dodged the hook and latched onto the murderer's arm with his teeth, furiously biting and clawing at him. Not a sound of pain erupted from Bloodbeard. He began swinging his arm, trying to shake off the shepherd. But Chase made sure to hold his grip. He wanted to make him pay. Pay for killing Sky. Pay for killing Ryder, Rubble, and Zuma. Pay for everything. Bloodbeard raised his hand and began to strangle Chase in an attempt to get him off. The pirate's strong grip around Chase's neck caused his intake of oxygen to become thinner and thinner. Chase's vision became blurred. Chase! Rocky yelled. Chase, unable to hold out anymore, had let go. Bloodbeard raised his hook and swung it. Crimson liquid drifted through the air as if in slow motion. Chase was waiting to feel pain, but to his confusion, pain did not come. His vision slowly came back into focus, and he saw Marshall standing in front of him, a hook parting his chest. Chase's eyes became wide in shock. Marshall? You... Why? Marshall's response began with a weak smile. Because... I really care about you. Chase could only watch as Marshall's beating heart was ripped right out of his chest. His now lifeless body fell to the ground. His white fur stained with crimson red. Marshall! Chase picked up the Dalmatian in his arms and held him crying as his own fur began to stain with his friend's blood. Rocky watched from a distance, speechless, unable to say even a word. In just a mere second, they had lost yet another friend. Chase lifted his head with even more rage burning in his eyes. He slowly laid Marshall's body back on the ground. You! Chase spoke with a dark voice. You just keep taking. Taking away everyone I care about. Taking away everyone I love. He clenched his teeth. No more. I've had enough! Chase charged for the pirate and pounced on his leg. He bit down on the leg repeatedly, but there was no effect. Bloodbeard swung his hook as Chase was trying to move away and cut a big gash onto the shepherd's side. Chase winched at the pain, but there was no way that he was going to stop. There was no turning back. Whether he ran or fought back, he knew that no matter what, death would come his way. He continued to attack the pirate, and with each futile attempt, he accumulated more wounds and gashes. Chase, stop. Just please stop. Rocky screamed within his mind. Chase's body was growing weaker and bloodier. Bloodbeard raised his hook, moving toward him. Is this really the best I can do? Chase asked himself, vision becoming blurry. Am I really unable to save anyone? He closed his eyes. Marshall. Sky. Everyone. Forgive me. Rocky felt his body go cold and numb as he watched Chase's head separate from his body and roll over in the grass. Bloodbeard turned to him and walked forward. No. Ch Chase. Marshall. He stared at both his friend's lifeless bodies. Why? Why did you leave me? He choked up. The pirate continued to walk closer. Rocky's image reflected in the pirate's red eye, and the pirate's hook reflected in the mixed breeds. Without even thinking, Rocky ran out of the park, running down the street as fast as he could while limping, not looking back. He didn't know where to go or what to do. He just ran. He passed by many houses. He wanted to stop and ask someone, anyone for help, but he knew that it would only put them in danger as well, and he just couldn't do that. 
he came across an alleyway deep in town and tried to take a shortcut, but was met with a dead end instead. He could hear Bloodbeard's footsteps getting closer, the heavy breathing getting louder. Trapped in the center of three walls, he covered his eyes shivering. Go away! Go away! Go away! Rocky? Rocky, wake up! Rocky opened his eyes, recognizing the voice. He almost cried. He couldn't believe it. He was back inside the lookout. Ryder, Sky, Rubble, Chase, Marshall, and Zuma were there standing before his eyes, smiling. You were having a bad dream, Rocky, Ryder told him. The others were silent. Rocky, still in disbelief, bursted into tears. Ryder! It was horrible! All of you were killed! Killed by a ghost pirate! I was the only one left! I felt so scared! So alone! I'm so sorry! So sorry for making fun of you all! I was afraid all along! He wailed. The other pups still remained silent. It's okay, Rocky. Everything's alright now. Ryder stretched his arms out inviting Rocky in for a comforting hug. Rocky ran into Ryder's arms, embracing him. Rocky felt so happy. Happy to see everyone safe. Happy to know that everything he witnessed was just a horrible dream. As he continued his embrace, a few realizations came to him. For one, he didn't fall asleep in the lookout. He fell asleep in his pup house. Two, he could still feel pain in his leg. And lastly, Ryder's hug. It felt... cold. Rocky gasped, eyes shooting open wide in shock. A hook was stabbed into Rocky's back. As Rocky gasped out in pain, he heard familiar heavy breathing. Raising his head up, he looked and saw the red pupilless eyeball on Ryder's face. At that moment, he knew he had been tricked. The setting of the lookout slowly faded away, revealing the alleyway that Rocky had ran to for cover. The one whom he had been embracing was none other than Bloodbeard. It was all an illusion. The murderous pirate had toyed with his mind, leading him to a false sense of security. The ghost pirate moved his face to Rocky, nose to nose, he began to speak. Those who gaze at the moon as I pass shall soon find that night to be their last. He spoke without moving his mouth and removed the hook from Rocky's back as the mixed breed started to lose consciousness. Rocky slowly fell to the ground as he watched Bloodbeard walk away. This was no dream, but a living nightmare. This was hell. Is this my punishment? I'm so sorry, every one. As Rocky hit the ground, the final red star vanished from around the blood moon, and not too long after, so did the ghost pirate. The red tint that covered the moon faded away, revealing a peaceful, yet deceiving, night sky. <laughs> Well, hello there, my horror crew. I hope you enjoyed today's narration. If you did, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe, turn on notifications, and click that bell. As you see right next to me are my social media links. They will be down in the description below if you want to check them out. So, yeah. I hope you all enjoyed today's video, and I will see you in the next one. Have a scary day, my horror crew. <laughs>